this may be it, so we'll get rolling. Uh, so last week, if you missed it, we were on five and six, primarily prayer and word. And then tonight, seven and eight. And then next week, nine and ten, we'll be done. It's gone by fast. Um, and tonight is obedience and scripture memory. So if you remember in the table of contents, he's unpacking that acronym for CLOSER. Communicate, meaning prayer. Learn, meaning the word, obey, obedience, store, scripture, memorization, then we'll cover evangelize and then renew, covering the here method, which will be a good way to close this out. So let's jump in uh, chapter seven then, which starts on page 99 in the book. And so the chapter's on obedience. Um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering maybe a twofold question. First question do you feel like there is a lack of obedience among Christians? And if so, why? Yes, I think there is disobedience. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. A lack of attention, I think, in my part, I wander off from some other subject, not not into anything bad. It's just that I'm not thinking about some things that I could be, you know, that I could be praying about. Yeah. Why else? Why else might there be a lack of obedience in the church? I think the world is just keep creeping into everything. Movies, everything, books. That's the that's the seeds that were sown on the in the business and all the other stuff. The weeds grew up in in, in with them in their in their prayer life, in our prayer life. I think neglecting the word Yeah. You know, thinking about our context here in Abilene, I think it's a fine line in Abilene on, is there a lack of obedience or are there just a bunch of false converts? You know, people who profess to be Christians who actually aren't born again. So, you know, you kind of got to make those distinctions, but by and large, I do feel like uh, Abilene, places like Abilene, we're certainly not alone, but, you know, with our three Christian universities and some, whatever, how many churches there are, I heard fairly recently there are 800, 790 something churches within a 60 mile radius of the center of Abilene, Texas. <laughs> so we're a very church town. Uh, so you're going to have, you know, a lot of people that come to church, but not necessarily interested in following the Lord, but. But even among those that are Christians, genuine born-again believers, I, I think obedience is lacking. Part of it may be we don't talk about it enough. I don't know. Um, something I, I'm realizing as I get a little bit older now, talking with younger people, uh, college age, and, well, you know, really anywhere from 15 to 25 probably, uh, I'm assuming too much. And I would say this is just an encouragement to you guys specifically about how our world has discipled our young people. And so to get specific for a moment with sexuality, uh, it's just kind of trivial now. And so you'll have even believers using the language of, yeah, you know, I slipped up. And the way I would interpret that, you know, maybe lust or maybe prolonged making out, but no, they mean they had sexual intercourse. And it's like, yeah, you know, slipped up here, slipped up there. And so I think it's just good for, I think Leah's right. I think the world and particularly the world's view of sexuality has just discipled our, our, especially our younger folks where all that they've known is just sexual morality, right? And think about any television show. That's the hard part today. You turn on any television show. And if you count it, I challenge you to do that sometime. You know, we probably all have some show we like. Next time you're watching your show, just get out pen and paper and mark the amount of times that fornication, to use the old King James word, is celebrated. So uh, 
disobedience in terms of sexual purity. I think that's a big one. So I think Leah's right. I think uh, they haven't been in the word, but also they've been discipled by other means. So I don't think we take that. You know, pornography is a whole nother conversation. You know, regularly we see stats that 70 to 80% of men regularly view pornography. And within the pandemic, you know, you've seen some, some stats where it's just gone even higher as people are at home more. And so you could just look at passage after passage, you know, talking about sexual purity. It's a big one. And it's kind of the air we breathe today. So we got to be talking about it, but. Well, let's see what he has to say. So on page 99, as he starts the chapter out, he's got a couple quotes there. First, he quotes Jesus and John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so if we love the Lord, we will obey him. Love and obedience go hand in hand. Then C.T. Studd, if Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. And so we want to we be growing obedience. And none of us, none of us here in this Zoom will uh, be perfectly obedient. We'll fall every day. But the point is we're wanting to grow in it, right? If we're believers, we want Christ to be Lord of all. And so really the Christian life is a lifelong progression of trying to submit everything we have to his lordship. So obedience is huge, and obedience is really what shows that we're believers, shows that we love the Lord. Sometimes I think people uh, mistake obedience for legalism. And if you talk about being rigorously obedient sometimes, well, he's just legalistic. No, legalism by definition is when we try to earn God's favor. And if you're a rigorously obedient Christian, you're, you know you're not trying to earn God's favor. You're trying to please him. Our aim is to please him in whatever we do. And so I think it was Dallas Willard said that uh, grace is opposed to earning, but grace is not opposed to effort. And so I think we as Christians always want to be growing in obedience. I mean, we ought to think every year, am I striving to obey him, to please him? Flip over to page 100. And look at that quote by Bill Hull right before the new section, about midway down on page 100. He says, I find it particularly puzzling that we struggle to put disciple making at the center of ministry, even though Jesus left us with the clear imperative to make disciples. And so when we're talking about obedience, especially in the context of this book and the context of D groups, we're talking about the obedience to the Great Commission, obedience to making disciples. And he, the next page there, he mentions Jesus and Jesus's way. And it really is fascinating when you think about it. You think about if you were Jesus or say you were Jesus's agent, all right, you're going to, Jesus is going to enter history in first century Rome. What method would you use? You've got 33 years, you know, what are you going to do? And he uses the illustration here of this, uh, 3,500 to 4,000 seat structure that we probably would put Jesus up in, right? Hey, Jesus is down. Let's go take him to every, you know, convention center and every major city in the country. And, uh, and he didn't. Instead, as he says here on page 101, his, and he did speak to the crowds at times, don't get me wrong, but his main method, the master's plan, is to focus on 12 men, training a dozen men to obey his commands. And so I think that's significant, again, as we think about modeling our life after the life of Jesus. It's the way he did it, right? It's the master plan of disciple making, investing in a few over time with the goal of multiplication. Look on 101 there at the bottom that finished the task section. Unfortunately, obedience is not a priority for many professing believers today. Too many Christians have bought into the idea that Christianity is little more than reciting a prayer or making a decision to receive Jesus in order to secure a position in heaven. A.W. Tozer believed that, quote, a notable heresy is coming to being throughout evangelical Christian circles the widely accepted concept that we humans can choose to accept Christ only because we need him as savior. And then we might have the right to postpone our obedience to him as Lord, as long as we want to salvation apart from obedience is unknown in the sacred scripture End quote. Genuine saving faith produces obedience to Christ's commands, including 
his command to make disciples. And so there was a whole movement. Uh, they, now we know it is the Lordship controversy, your Lordship salvation controversy. And it's, it was, it came out of Dallas seminary, actually. Dallas did some good things, but this teaching, this idea that we could have Jesus as savior, yet not as Lord, uh, became very popular. And of course you just can't, you can't find that anywhere in scripture. And then in our circles, what we've done now is this whole, you can call it a lot of things. You can call it easy believism. You can call it um, decisionalism. And our emphasis on evangelism, as especially as Southern Baptists, is a great emphasis. Yet sometimes we've emphasized evangelism to the, to the neglect of discipleship. And we've just focused on getting that person to walk the aisle or to pray the prayer, to make a decision and think that we've done our job. And, you know, that looks good when we can say, well, we baptized 100 people this year. We, you know, that looks good on paper and it's a lot easier to measure than actually making disciples. But again, we've seen the call of Jesus is to make disciples. And those, those entry points are obviously important, but they're just the starting point, right? So yes, we need to celebrate baptisms, absolutely. But we also need to celebrate funerals when people finish well. And that's what Jesus talked about a lot is finishing well. And he has a lot of warnings. We'll look at one in here a little bit. So he can't be Savior without being Lord. And then again, all we got to do is, is Dinah mentioned, all we get, if we're in the Word, we're going to see it. If we're reading the Word, we're going to get it. It's the beauty of reading the Bible regularly. It's the beauty of expositional preaching is we're exposed to the Word again and again and again. And here he mentions um, Jesus' prayer, his high priestly prayer in John 17. So Jesus is praying. He's about to go to the cross. And in John 17, he prays and he says, let me read it. He says, so Jesus is speaking to the father and he says, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. What did he accomplish at that point? He's been training disciples. Yeah. Yeah. If we, if we didn't read this and didn't have any context and we just said, hey, what's the work Jesus came to accomplish? What would we all say? It's death on the cross. Yeah, we say cross. It's finished, which is true, obviously. But here, the work that he already accomplished before the cross is setting up a plan, basically. Training his disciples who would make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. Pretty significant. Look on page 103, to know or not to know. Being a disciple, however, involves far more than gaining knowledge about God in the Bible. Many professing believers have read the entire Bible many times, and they've attended church and Sunday school for many years. Still, they are far from being Christ's true disciples. They know the answers to all the questions in the Bible quiz, but they're missing the essence of following Christ. Discipleship is obedience to Christ's commands. And then he quotes 1 John 2. We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in, in him, but whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we're in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And again, talking about obeying the commandments, what, what do we define as the great commission? Making disciples. So a disciple is one who makes disciples. To so truly be a disciple, we are then making disciples. And I don't want to guilt you if you haven't been involved with this. And also I want to remind us that it looks a whole lot of different ways. Discipleship, disciple making can take on a lot of forms. For stay-at-home moms, it looks one way. For someone with a full-time job, it looks one way. For a missionary, it looks another way. For a pastor, it looks another way. The goal is that we're moving people along. We're helping people follow the Lord. So just because you're not having, maybe you've never been in a D group, you're not a one now, it doesn't mean you're not necessarily making disciples. But we need to be doing something. He says something real similar on 105. There at the bottom, that last paragraph. Dave Browning, in deliberately sim deliberate simplicity, stated, we are convinced that the gap holding back most believers is not the gap between what they know and what they don't know. 
It's the gap between what they know and what they're living. And I would just pause real quick and say, this is Southside. Praise God, Southside is a, is a biblically literate church. Uh, we've been taught well for a long time. The question is now, are we applying what we know? Many Christians are educated beyond their obedience. Most Christians do not need to attend another Bible study to grow in their relationship with the Lord. They need to start living what they have already learned. Mark Twain said it best, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the things in the Bible that I do understand that bother me. Stop wondering about what you don't know and start obeying the things that you do. A strong word there, right? I've shared before uh, the illustration Francis Chan uses to where he, t- he tells his kids to go clean his room. And he's saying, how would I respond if instead, you know, they didn't, they didn't do it, but they huddled together and they got the kids together and they even invited some friends together and they studied the word, you know, clean your room and they diagram it and they even look in the original and they pick it apart and then they wait till the next week to meet again and they never obey it. <laughs> and I think that's the challenge for churches like us. We're, we've got some solid biblical foundation. I just wonder how much of our congregation are now obeying it. I do think so many Christians in America are, quote, educated beyond their obedience. So that's a good word. Let me stop here. Any, any comments, questions before we read some scripture? Clarifications? Flip over to Luke chapter 9. He spends some time looking at Luke 9 and looking at some roadblocks for why we don't obey it or don't heed it. While you're turning there, my favorite, it's not my favorite actually, it makes me mad, but my most uh, jarring illustration of the problem we have in America was when I I did a, a trip, took a summer mission trip to New York City. Um, we were there for two weeks and it was with a bunch of college students through a place called Go Now Missions. And man, we got, well, I could say a lot about it. For one, we got there and basically most of the team just wanted to do tourism, you know, go to the Tonight Show and, you know, go various places. So I ended up on my own quite a bit because um, they were, you know, having fun and we were there to do mission and I'd raise money. People had given me money there not to go, you know, have fun, but to do evangelism. We go to I ended up going, and I, it was hard, obviously, and uh, I would use basketball to try to start conversations, and so I would go and play pickup games at various parks across New York City and went to Harlem and then went to Queens. Well, in Queens, one of the – and there's historic, there's historic outdoor parks all over New York City, and so I'd go to the ones I'd heard of. So I go to Queens, and one of them is filled with a bunch of kids and then a bunch of people, like, you know, tucked in khakis, it was very diverse ethnically, but then a bunch of white people in tucked in khakis. So I was like, okay, these are either Mormons or Christians here doing something. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going around and sure enough, it's, it's some, it's a church. It's, it's actually a Baptist church from Texas <laughs> and they're doing a VBS type outreach there on the court. And so I, I was going to have to go somewhere else, but I struck up a conversation with one of the leaders and he was telling me what they were doing. And of course, first thing he tells me is all the decisions they had made. You know, we had, I don't remember the number, but it was big, you know, 40s or 50 kids received Christ this week at VBS. I'm like, man, that's great. Uh, and they're all, you know, lots of Muslims, Hindus, very, very diverse. And so I said, well, are y'all meeting any parents? Well, no, no, we haven't been able to do that. We just, you know, we want to get the kids. Okay, well, is there like a follow-up plan? Like, are there, are there a local church here that you're going to partner with? And no, 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 no. We just want to, if we get them to pray that prayer, God will take care of the rest. Um, so... It's just, it's, they, they get to go back then. They get to go back to their church and then celebrate this mission trip where 150 whatever decisions were made. And then they leave these kids in Hindu and Muslim homes with nothing, right? And so that's part of the problem. It's just propagating the problem. Instead of having a long-term plan to make disciples in of these children, we end up just having inflated numbers, which is, by the way, why in our own convention, Southern Baptist Convention, there are 16 million uh, members of the Southern Baptist churches in the nation 
and there are, someone take a guess how many that we can find, like we can actually account for. Someone want to guess out of 16 million? Two million. I didn't hear. Two million. Two? More than that, thankfully, but not much. Six. Around six. So the Southern Baptist Convention has 16 million people, yet on any given Sunday, we've only got six million in our churches. It's just, it is just terrible. Because we focus too much on making decisions or getting decisions than actually helping people follow the Lord. All right, Luke chapter 9. Get off my soapbox here. Luke 9, verse 57. Let's read to <coughs> the end of the chapter. <coughs> so, so the subheading here, the cost of following Jesus. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, you know what you're getting into. You don't, I don't even have a home. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those in my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. These are really strong verses. He says something real similar in Luke 14. So Jesus doesn't try to lower the bar. It seems like he raises the bar. Say, I'll follow you. Well, hold on. Are you sure about this? Because this is what you're getting into. And to where we want to lower the bar. And the classic example is the, the altar call where you have the pastor saying, you know, everybody close your eyes. Everybody bow your heads. No one looking. If you're ready to follow Jesus, slip that hand up. I see that hand. And Jesus is like not wanting to make it easy. If, you want in, if you're in this thing, you better stand up and let everybody know. And you better count the cost and don't look back and get serious. So the call, is, uh, the call is clear and the call is hard. And again, the fundamental call is the Great Commission. And in that commission, part of it is what are we teaching? What are we teaching people in the Great Commission? According to that verse. Teaching them to become disciples, followers of Jesus. Well, co co their followers. Yeah, that's right. I'm looking for the wording of the Great Commission, though. Teaching them to observe okay. all things that I have commanded. Yeah. So teaching them obedience. Jesus, let me close here. This chapter out on 109, he says, Jesus issued many commands for us to follow. Don't overlook his last and most crucial one, make disciples. Any, any, anything from this chapter was particularly helpful or challenging to y'all? I'm kind of a visual person. I really like the triangle on page 107, the knowing, loving, obeying. And how that, you know, it's just knowing to loving to obeying and back to knowing. It never ends.
All right, let's keep moving then. Chapter eight on meditation and memorization starts on 111. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then look at that Chuck there, that uh, quote there from Chuck Swindoll, 111. I know of no other single practice in the Christian life more rewarding, practically speaking, than memorizing scripture. No other single exercise pays greater spiritual dividends. Your prayer life will be strengthened. Your witnessing will be sharper and much more effective. Your attitudes and outlook will begin to change. Your mind will become alert and observant. Your confidence and assurance will be enhanced. Your faith will be solidified. <laughs> Next page. Next page, uh, that first full paragraph is worth reading in full as well. The art of memorization is quickly becoming a thing of the past. In the first century, however, memorization was critical. In an age when the only way to store and transmit material was to copy it by hand, men and women had to commit information to memory. Imagine waking up tomorrow to a world without written words. Life as we know it would come to a screeching halt because we depend on electric sources for practically all of our information. Everything we know is uploaded from external memories, such as hard drive servers and websites. Few people these days can quickly recall phone numbers of family members or friends. For that matter, some cannot recall their own phone number without checking their electronic devices. Fully realizing that we live in such an age, a time when we are bombarded with a world of easily accessible information, I tread boldly in presenting to you the discipline of scripture memorization. But a pretty crucial crucial discipline, you know, to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And uh, I feel like I've been trying, been at trying at memorization for a long time, really since I became a Christian. And I'm now, what am I, 37, 37 or 38, can't remember. But already, and some of you who are older will attest this, I'm already frustrated by how hard it is, even from five years ago to memorize the Bible. It just gets harder and harder with each year, it feels like. but a worthwhile discipline. I wanted to share some tools that he doesn't mention in here. Um, my opinion is that Christians ought to always be memorizing verses. Just, it's just something we do all the time. And so whether that's one verse that like we've been getting suggestions from or uh, larger, larger sections, I would encourage you if you've never tried to try to memorize a large section of scripture. And uh, there's this little book here. I've got a link. I'm gonna see how I haven't tried this yet, but I'll try to share it because it's free. You can get this PDF for free. Let me see if I can bring you Let me put it in the link here. I don't know if you can touch the link or if you could just copy and paste the link. If not, email me if you don't get it. But basically it's a it's a pastor in a where is he at? Durham, North Carolina, and it's just a practice of, of doing it. This particular guy, he's probably 50. He's memorized, I think, most of the New Testament, and he's, he's like contemporary. We hear that, and like pastors 100 years ago, they did that all the time, but nowadays it's pretty rare. Well, this is a pretty helpful method if you need some tools. He's got some tools in the book, but this one I found pretty helpful, pretty thorough. Um, say more about that in a little bit. Let's flip to Psalm 1 first, though. And here's the beauty of what we've been talking about with prayer and when we begin to pray the Bible and then memorize Scripture is all three of these practices, you know, they're pretty fluid, right? So if we're praying Scripture, by default, we're, we're meditating on Scripture and we're usually memorizing it as well. If we're memorizing it, we're meditating on it. So all goes hand in hand. The verse that he encourages us to memorize this week comes from Psalm 1. And Psalm 1 is just such a great psalm, a great psalm to have memorized. Hugely important as it kicks off the whole book of Psalms. And remember in the Old Testament, or really in the New Testament, this word blessed means happy, joyful, contentment. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. 
He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. I love the imagery. You know, the delight is in the law, the law he meditates. And if we're meditating on the word, it's just going to go well for us. Even when things go bad, right? If we're centered on the, the word, on the Lord, even when we have bad days, we can still be like trees planted by streams of water. We're going to be fruitful people. Things are going to go well. We're going to prosper. We're meditating on the word regularly. So memorization and meditation go hand in hand. What's the difference between what we mean by meditation and what the world typically means by meditation? Secular meditation. Zoning out, like meditation, like clear your mind, like zone out. Yeah. Would be the world. Yeah, it's good. So they say clear your mind, where we say fill your mind. Or another way to say it is the secular meditation is more just passive, where biblical meditation is active. Look over on page 116. I'm going to put another link in there as well. Uh, we're turning over there. Some videos that same pastor has. His name's Andy Davis. Bottom of 116, Bible brew. Memorizing the scripture saturates your life with God's word. In Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, Donald Whitney illustrates the effect of memorizing the word with a cup of hot tea. Whitney explains, you are the cup of hot water and the intake of scripture is represented by the tea bag. Hearing God's words like one dip of the tea bag into the cup. Some of the tea's flavor is absorbed by the water, but not as much as would occur with more, a more thorough soaking of the bag. He adds, in this analogy, reading, studying, and memorizing God's word are represented by additional plunges of the tea bag into the cup. The more frequently the tea enters the water, the more effect that it has. So it's one thing to read a quick chapter or two before you go, but if you're med you take something with you, you've got it with you all day, it's, it's affecting you in a much stronger way. Your flavor will be stronger. And then he just goes through and mentions a whole lot of verses about it. He mentions Colossians 3, we are to set our minds on things above. He mentions Romans 12, that really foundational verse of renewing. How are we transformed? We're transformed by the renewing of the mind. What's the main way our mind is renewed? Well, it's through the word. Talks about being renewed in knowledge after the image of Jesus. And then he mentions several of the benefits starting on page 118. The benefits of memorizing scripture. And I ought to add attempting to memorize because uh, there's so much that I've memorized and probably had at one point, but it's gone now, but still I've been formed and shaped by it. So any effort to, you know, digest the word of God is fruitful effort, even if you don't have it three weeks later. But look at the benefits there on 118. He says, uh, meditation and memorization, number one, they keep you from sin. So if you're being tempted and if there's a particular sin that you continue to uh, battle, man, you ought to know two or three or four passages about it. And so you're tempted to do it. Boom, what comes to mind? Whatever word. We already read Psalm 119. Number two, meditation and memorization transform your thinking. Again, Romans 12, 2. Number three, meditation and memorization equip you to share your testimony. First Peter 3 talks about always being ready. Number four, meditation and memorization provide direction for your life. The word is a lamp and a light. Number five, meditation and memorization produce spiritual growth because the word builds us up. Again, the main means the spirit uses to change us is his word. Number six, meditation and memorization equip you to fight temptation. And he mentions Jesus there. Classically in Matthew 4, he's tempted by the devil. He's the son of God. What does he do? He quotes scripture. So he had it memorized and he brought it to bear against the devil. And that's what he talks about the rest of the chapter is having the word is being armed for battle. 
think about Ephesians 6 with the, uh, the spiritual armor. There's really only one offensive weapon. There's your shield and your shoes and all that helmet. And then the one offensive weapon is the word, the sword of the spirit. So clearly really important um, practice. And he gives a few steps. Uh, this book he mentions, this is Donald Whitney's Spiritual Disciplines of the Christian Life. It's probably the, the, the singular most helpful book on the disciplines. And then here he talks a lot about memorization. And I think he's got like 17 methods. Let me just mention some. You, there's some in the book. Let me just mention some of the ways you can memorize. Again, there's really no wrong way to engage, right? But here's number one. Have a verse, emphasize different words in the text. So say there's 10 words, well, each time reread it three or four times, emphasizing a different word. And it's amazing how the word comes alive when you do that. Uh, method number two, rewrite the text in your own words. Formulate a principle you can remember from the text. Think of an illustration if you're a visual learner. What's some picture that you can use to help you remember? Look for applications. Ask how it points to Jesus. Is it answering a certain question? And then just pray. Pray the text. Just flat memorize it. Repeat the thing. Uh, what else does he have? He's got a lot. I think it's a whole chapter on this thing. But there's, at the end of the day, find what works for you. Here he, in a Galilee, just says, picture it, ponder it, personalize it, pray over it. So do whatever you need to do. Uh, and thankfully, there's a ton of helps. You know, there's my favorite is the, uh, it's called Fighter Verses. And it's an app that's free. Um, but you could just type in Bible memory in the app store and find whatever works for you. There's one called, I think it's called Scripture Memory. And depending on how you learn, it's got ways you can learn. You can hear it. You can hear it audibly. You can write it out, type it out. You can just do it rotely. Uh, what I like about Fighter Verses is they give you suggestions, but they also uh, let you have a lock screen. And so like for mine right now is 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12. So every time I pick up my phone, I see the verse. Uh, and, you know, we pick up our phones a lot. So you can just take a picture, make it your wallpaper, memorize the verse. So fighter verses is one of the better ones. Uh, it's called scripture typer is the other one. No, it's just called Bible memory now. There's probably tons since I've even looked. Or just go old school and uh, have a bunch of note cards. Uh, you got a wallet, you're standing in line, pull out your note card. In fact, I've got, yeah. This would be embarrassing if I try to recall these, but I mean, these are, you can see these are brown. So here's my, here's my note cards. <laughs> Problem is some of them were different uh, Bible translations. But again, any, any work, any work, any word works and be fruitful. So take a note card. If you want to put one verse on one side, I mean, he's got some samples. Do whatever you need to do. The point is, get to work. Have them in your car. I've got a thing right here on my desk. So I work from kind of a book stand. And I've got key proverbs. Now, I don't have these memorized here in the middle, but I see them and I'm regularly reading through them, knowing that they're forming. I couldn't quote probably any of these proverbs, but... I'm getting down in my in my soul. Uh, what what has kept you from memorizing scripture? What have been some of the hindrances for you? I'll say time. should say time and lack of discipline. <laughs> yeah. Just, I think, like you said, because I know I can look on my phone, look in one of my five Bibles, phone a friend, I know I can get to it somehow, then I just, I get lazy about having it in here. Yeah.
one time I was memorizing a bigger chunk, like a whole chapter, and I got stuck and I just like, I didn't understand it. And so I started looking for commentaries on it or whatever. And I'm like, you know, Lord, why have you led me to leave this huge, you know, this big chunk? And the next day, my devotional and the little devotional book was titled, It Is Written. And it talks about the importance, like when Jesus was tempted, the first words out of his mouth were, it is written. You know, like if Jesus had to have scripture memorized, it's probably pretty important for me as well. Like my memorization, I do a whole lot better with big chunks than I do little scattered verses. I, and I love that we're doing the Sermon on the Mount this year. So I had already, I, I'm cheating because I had memorized that five or six years ago. But like you say, you don't keep it. Yeah. So, so I'm loving going back and, and recapturing it. But I thought I use four by six cards and little flip uh, like photo album things. And uh, yeah, but I love memorizing it where it one builds on the other. Yeah. It's hard work. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other tips that have worked for y'all? In the past, when I've memorized, it's been using the little navigators have these series of cards that will have sections that are topically connected of verses. And these cards are, they're much smaller than the, uh, the, the index cards you had. They're about, you know, three by two. And each one has one or two verses on it, uh, but in, in different sections. And, when I used to be disciplined, I would take them with me and, and just constantly be picking them up and going through them. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to play the age card. When you get a little bit older, it's hard to remember that you have to go back and do it over and over and over again. Something that was helpful for me was putting the card on um, somewhere like on your steering, steering wheel or somewhere in your car. Uh, so when you're driving, you get in, you can look at it and then like not read it while you're driving, obviously, but like you can think about it instead of listening to the radio or music or something, you can think about the verse and just kind of mold it over your head while you're driving. Um, and you already get, you know, if your commute is 15 minutes, you already get 30 minutes out of your day that you're going to be like focused on that that verse yeah no doubt man redeeming the commute it probably helps you keep from making the wrong kinds of comments about the drivers and other cars on the road too <laughs> well like I had all my scripture memory cards with me and I was making trips back and forth between Abilene and Fort Worth. And I would work on them as I drove back and forth to go see my grandsons. And uh, that was almost 20 years ago. And I went to sleep. She scattered memory verses for a half mile. Then <laughs> <laughs> Hey, maybe some police officer got saved or something. It just cost you a leg, Leah, but it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. God <laughs> is good. He's worth my life. <laughs> no doubt. One thing that we fell into in the last couple of years um, overseas, just in storying, is you know taking a narrative and you know, we don't want to become Bible translators. There's a place for word for word memorization, but we had to, to memorize stories and tell those stories. And so that was just another way, you know, we kind of give ourselves grace and not, not, you know, we didn't have the precision, but we were 
internalizing a lot of scripture um, by memorizing stories. And so I thought I was encouraged by that, by that exercise. And that's something to think about too. The widow's mic, for example, is that you get four verses there, you just learn to tell that story. And so um, that's something to think about. Uh, dear brother uh, in Kentucky uh, was diagnosed with a brain tumor and it eventually killed him. But uh, before uh, he was having surgery and the doc brain surgeon came in to him and said, Hey, we're about to take out part of your brain. Uh, is there anything you'd like to remember? And he said, well, I've spent the better part of my life uh, memorizing and learning how to handle the scriptures. I'd like to remember those. And for the next year when, I mean, just kind of, was a vegetable a bit, but I mean, could still interact. Uh, his mind was the clearest whenever he was singing hymns and reciting scripture. I mean, it was amazing the clarity that came over him in those points. I mean, hardly didn't recognize people, couldn't interact. Uh, but whenever, I mean, scripture would come to his mind. I mean, he was as lucid as he was for that last year. And so it was just, it was a real practical encouragement to us to see, all right, this is, this is a practical way that memorizing scripture can serve you in the long haul. Cause he couldn't read for himself or anything like that, but, the word was still ministering to him. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Well, I'm going to challenge you to get to it if you haven't been. And if you want to do big chunks, man, you can't go better than Romans 8 uh, or like Ephesians 2 or the Sermon on the Mount with F260. For me personally, I have found I've, I use a lot of different Bible translations, and uh, but I have found that for me, and I don't I throw this out there in case it's helpful to y'all. It may not be, but I have found that it's easier for me to memorize uh, more lofty English. Uh, so, like an NIV or a CSB or a NLT or a um, I don't know, some of the more contemporary that, that are really easy to read, but they kind of sound like you're reading the newspaper. Uh, I have a lot more trouble memorizing those than something like the ESV or the New King James or even the King James that are in that tradition that have a little bit of cadence uh, to, the, to the language, you know. Uh, so if you have trouble, maybe try that. I mean, obviously, we use the ESV a lot here at Southside anyway, but... Um, I, I found that kind of the hard way that the more cadence type English uh, is actually easier to put to memory. Uh, and then there's of course songs. And if you guys have kids, man, what a way to right now, the main way that I'm memorizing scripture is through teaching the kids. And so anytime we're at, a, at the table, we're memorizing scripture together. So if you have kids, man, they're so spongy. And then of course you get the benefit of you learning it as well. Last week was fun because just providentially the memory verse was Romans 12, nine and 10 which is what the sermon was on. So, uh, man, have verses you're, you're having kids memorize all the time. Uh, and at the end of the day, it just becomes our priorities, right? Because we are busy, but we always do have the time. We can cut something out or we can redeem commutes or we can redeem weights or whatever it is. If you've got it on your phone or in your wallet, you can always pull it out. So, And then with our context with D groups, for me, there's nothing better than accountability. And so whether it's with a, with a spouse or with a friend or at the D group, if you're memorizing and, you know, hey, we're going to get together, we're going to read our verses together, that's, that is extremely helpful to be memorizing, memorizing scripture and community, and it just spurs you on because you know you're going to be talking about it. So challenge one another and get to work memorizing the word. All right, well, we're about out of time. Let me pray for us, and then uh, 9 and 10, let's finish strong next week. Uh, 10 is going to be super practical. Um, but we'll talk about evangelism and then hearing from the Lord. Good to see y'all. We pray and we'll be done. God, thank you for your word. And uh, thank you for its challenge to us. We do confess that we are often negligent and disobedient. We want to be those who obey wholeheartedly and with fullness. And so we ask for your help for continued growth and obedience. And especially this particular commandment that we're focusing on that we would have new resolve to make disciples and you would give us wisdom and you would give us favor. You would give us boldness as uh, as we leave here and as we get back to life as normal, Lord, would we begin to make a difference in people's lives? And Lord, would you uh, help us to prioritize your word? Give us fruit and favor even early on, Lord, as we think about your word, make it come easy to us 
Uh, give us fruit. Give us opportunities to bring your word to bear, whether it be with unbelievers or encouraging another brother or sister in Christ. Uh, give us opportunities and, and motivate us. We confess that we're weak and our culture is weak intellectually, filled with the distractions. So we, uh, we want to know your word better. And so we ask for your help to that end. Uh, Lord, bless our night. Bless our week. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.